I'd like to thank Tom Sampson for putting this together. A lot of what I have to say is more of a historical perspective, and Tom, I'll try to avoid falling into that trap where they talk about nothing more boring than listening to somebody talk about the way things used to be. Or as my wife says, the older I get, the greater I used to be. Uh, there'll be a few pregnant pauses in here because the audio cuts out in the transition between slides. We certainly credit Jim Glick with being the father of hip arthroscopy as we know it today. And he was certainly influenced by his young partner, Tom Sampson, and together they developed the lateral decubitus position for performing hip arthroscopy. We performed our first hip scope here in Nashville in 1990. But to back up for a second, Dr. Andrews didn't teach me how to do hip arthroscopy, but he certainly provided me with the skill set that allowed me to connect the dots to figure out how to put this together. One of my partners had a 16-year-old kid with loose bodies in his hip two years following close treatment of an acetabular fracture. And she was going to do an arthrotomy and take him out and said, what do you think about trying to do something arthroscopically? I thought, hmm, I've never heard of such a thing. But I said, hey, as long as we don't do something dumb like cut the femoral nerve, we'll try. And when it doesn't work, you can flip him over and do your arthrotomy and take out the loose bodies. This is that first case, and I just used the skills Dr. Andrews taught me for taking loose bodies out of other joints. We used the largest shaver we had. We got the biggest cannulas we could find, and some we had to freehand. We stole some pituitary rongeurs from the neurosurgeons, but the bottom line is it worked. Now, after that, about once a year, I'd have somebody land on my doorstep with loose bodies, and after a couple of years, we'd done three loose bodies. And one of our physical therapists came to me and said, you know, I've rehabbed these people, these loose bodies in their hip. He said, I think my brother's got loose bodies in his hip. He'd been in a motorcycle accident 14 years before, had to give up work framing houses because he never knew when his hip was going to give out on him. All his studies were normal. We thought, well, maybe you've got some sort of radiolucent loose bodies that we just can't see. And after 14 years of symptoms, maybe it's not premature to say, let's take a look. Well, I fully expected it to be a normal hip scope, and I thought, well, if I'm going to scope a normal hip, we might as well make a good educational video out of it. So this is that case in 1992, expecting to see a normal hip, and we looked in, and what he had was this bucket handle tear of his labrum flipped inside the joint, which we excised, and after 14 years, his symptoms were gone. And that's when a little light went off in my head and said, you know, there's other things inside the hip we just don't understand very well besides loose bodies. And that's really what set me on this trek. As an aside, 25 years later, his hip's still normal and he's still pain free, just keeping in mind that labral debridement is not always a bad operation. In 1994, we published our technique with the supine position. And that was based on simply a dozen cases at the time. So I emphasize to young people that you don't have to have done thousands of something or be part of a big group in order to have something meaningful to contribute to the literature. I do remember when they accepted the paper for publication, the editor wrote on there, the need for the lateral position will become obvious, and I'm, I'm still sort of waiting. In 1995, a number of things happened. This was the first scientific paper ever accepted for presentation at the Academy on anything having to do with hip arthroscopy. We had collected a few labral tears and I put together a manuscript and submitted it to clinical orthopedics. They sent it back with a lot of revisions and I meticulously made every single correction that they recommended. I sent it back in and they rejected it anyway. They said it was anecdotal and I was editorializing. Well, I sent it over to the Arthroscopy Journal and they liked it so much they published it as a current concept. Now back in 1995, we were still struggling along with the handful of instruments that had come from somewhere. And I tell people we learned to be atraumatic with our technique early on, but for the wrong reasons, not so much to avoid damaging the joint, but to avoid damaging our instruments because we had a few reusable shaver blades. If you bent one, you didn't just go pull another one off the shelf. You sent it back to the factory to be reworked. I'd been pestering Charlie Federico, the president of Dionics, which then became Smith and Nephew Endoscopy, for a couple of years to see if he would make some instruments. Finally, he relented and said, okay, Thomas, where's this thing heading? I said, well, I think it'll probably take on the prevalence of maybe elbow arthroscopy, but I didn't want any sort of pretense that it might catch up with the shoulder or the knee. 
So he agreed and sent down a couple of guys, Steve Fitzpatrick, who ran the precursor to the Surgeon Inventors Program for Smith and & Nephew, and Tim Callahan, one of their engineers. And within three months, we had a completed set of instruments. I don't know that you could accomplish that in today's world. But I'm a pretty simple guy. I leave the complex, sophisticated stuff to some of the more brilliant minds. But there were really only three things that I wanted to accomplish over the instruments that we had. I wanted to make the cannula as long as we could possibly make it, but still use it with the standard arthroscope. I didn't want to have to bring into the picture extra long custom arthroscopes because nobody's going to purchase those for doing an occasional hip case. I wanted to make the obturator sharp, which we'll reflect on in a moment. And I also wanted to cannulate the obturator. Maximizing the cannula length, we just made the bridge as short as possible. And we also shortened the hub on the cannula, or the base of the cannula, to give us another half a centimeter or so. And where we shortened the base, it made it a little more wobbly where it linked with the bridge. So we had to add a double J-lock instead of a single J-lock to make it secure. Fast forwarding a few years, there were two problems with the double J-lock hip cannula. First, with the tight tolerances, there's a little bit of a fiddle factor trying to get the cannula to couple with the bridge. Secondly, because of the dense soft tissues that would tend to grab the cannula, as you would rotate counterclockwise, it would tend to uncouple even with the double J-lock. In this illustrative example, it looks pretty simple getting the cannula to lock on, but oftentimes there's a little bit more of a futz factor with it. And as you rotate counterclockwise, that's where the cannula would often uncouple from the bridge. And that's where years later, the J-snap was developed. And this is a product that I was particularly enamored with because whenever you have a product that's solving a problem, you have to ask yourself, how big is the problem? Well, it solved two problems that occurred on every single case as far as the difficulty clicking the bridge and the cannula together and the cannula becoming uncoupled every time you rotate it around. Now, I'd like to take credit for this, but Alec Torrey, one of the engineers with Smith & Nephew, is a person who took it on himself to develop this product. Here's how the J-snap works. It just pops on and you can rotate the lens however you want to and it's not going to uncouple the cannula from the bridge. Now, let's go back to 1995. That ends number one. The second item was to make the obturator sharper. And to give you perspective, traditionally we had blunt obturators and sharp tri-flanged trocars. The blunt obturators available really weren't sharp enough to penetrate the dense hip capsule. The trocar would penetrate the capsule, but with the tri-flanged configuration, you can imagine how traumatic that could be to the joint surfaces. This is how we used them. The assistant kept the capsule distended with fluid. I'd use a trocar just to barely get through the capsule. Then we would substitute the blunt obturator for final entry into the hip joint. And that's where the sharper obturator would allow you to penetrate the capsule, but was certainly more atraumatic to the joint surfaces. So that was easy to create a sharp obturator, solving the number two problem. Then the third thing, cannulating the obturator, ended up being the most challenging part because it's not easy to drill a hole down a long, skinny obturator. Tim Callahan had to farm this out, and they used this gun drilling process, which they used for making gun barrels. The idea was that we could then put a spinal needle into the joint, pass a nitinol guide wire that we just took from the ACL interference screw set, and pass the cannula obturator assembly over the guide wire. So this is what we're able to accomplish, getting a cannulated obturator. Now, the last thing we needed to do was to was to pick the right spinal needle. What I was looking for was the smallest outside diameter needle that the inside diameter would accommodate passage of the guide wire. And that's where I looked up my old college roommate, Wayne Brinster. He's the one on the right, who at this point was an executive with Becton Dickinson. Spoke to Wayne and he said, Thomas, this project's too small for us. 
Well, why don't you touch base with these popper folks up in New York who specialize in syringes and needles? And that's where I learned that not all spinal needles are the same. It's not just about the gauge. The wall thickness can be thin, extra thin. So I had them just send me all the tubing. I just sat there and slid the wire through the various tubing to find out what was the smallest one that would allow the wire to pass. I don't think in today's world you could get away with that. You'd have to do more bench testing and friction analysis. But that was the birth of the 17 gauge extra thin walled spinal needle. Now the wall thickness wasn't an issue for placing the needle because you had just as much metal with the thin wall. You just had more of the metal in the stylus and less in the wall of the needle itself. As my economics professor used to say, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Everything costs you something. Before the cannulated system with the joint distended, as the cannula entered the capsule, it would just tend to push the labrum out of the way. But with the cannulated system, wherever the spinal needle goes is where the cannula is going to go. So your needle placement became more imperative. This is a little article I wrote back in 2000, which I felt was important, really detailing precisely how to avoid the labrum in hip arthroscopy. Now, I'm just going to finish with a couple of clinical points. This is a paper that I was most proud of, prospective analysis of hip arthroscopy with two-year follow-up. Remember back in the 90s, evidence-based medicine was just starting to arise. Things were published with three and six month follow up. So I felt very proud with our two year follow up. And the important message here is I tell people I've only done two smart things in my life. One was marrying my wife, and the other was early on with this hip arthroscopy. I had no idea where it was going, but I didn't want to get years down the road and be wondering how these patients did. So we started tracking our data early on. And for the young people listening to this, I encourage you to start keeping track of your data early. In today's world, there's so many software systems and things where it's much easier to do because you never know how your practice is going to evolve. Now, fast forwarding a little bit, this was the first paper that I ever had the courage to submit to JBJS, prospective analysis of hip arthroscopy with 10 year follow up on all patients. I thought for sure this would get accepted. Well, they rejected it. They didn't offer any revisions. They just said it wasn't contemporary. I'm like, not contemporary, it's 10 year follow up data. They just rejected it. I turned around and submitted it to clinical orthopedics and they readily published it. Now I felt a small sense of vindication years later when the editor who rejected my paper subsequently sent his daughter to me for arthroscopic surgery. So sometimes it takes a while for things to come around. Now lastly, a few comments about labral management. Historically, I had to have a compelling reason to repair the labrum because our results of labral debridement really weren't all that bad. The healing capacity of the labrum was uncertain. Our repair techniques were primitive and the rehab process was onerous. Well, there's a growing number of studies report superior results of labral repair over resection. Each of these have methodological flaws. Even the one prospective randomized study comparing repair and debridement is flawed because the patients knew which operation they got. And as a patient, I think I'd be more satisfied knowing that my labrum had been preserved. Regardless of these flaws, there aren't any studies that suggest that superior results with debridement over repair. So in today's world, I have to have a compelling reason not to repair the labrum because the healing capacity is excellent, the techniques and technology for repair have been advanced, and the rehab process has been streamlined and much less onerous. The reason I mention that is because I think it's important to remember that in this journey from resection to restorative techniques, history does repeat itself. My father was a general surgeon who began his career as a medical officer in the Stonewall Jackson Brigade of the 29th Infantry. He oversaw the medical evacuation of Normandy Beach. The 29th was the point of the spear in the D-Day invasion and they lost 75% of their officers in the first 24 hours. Fortunately, he was part of the 25%. When my father passed away, I remember going through some of his papers and I found this paper written by his chief of surgery, Dr. Barney Brooks. And you have to remember that at the beginning of the last century, all surgery was ablative surgery. It was amputations, abscesses, the occasional tumor. Dr. Brooks wrote about doing a gastrojejunostomy, 
and there were surgeons there watching him do the procedure and they commented that it was indeed a strange sort of operation because nothing was removed. Well, I think in the world of hip preservation, we've reached that point where it's not just resection, taking stuff out, but true restoration. With that point, greetings from Nashville and everyone be safe.